Okay, hello. Um, I know this has been getting a bit frustrating for some of you, and I wish I could give you something to assuage the frustration we all feel. Uh, three Nor'easterners in about a couple of weeks can be a bit frustrating, but just hang in there. Spring will come. Um, <clears throat> just some housekeeping, just to go over a few things. I did send out an email that had provisos. you got to have contingencies sometimes in life. So here's what's going to happen. Those that are taking the retake, okay, will meet on Thursday. Most of you have scheduled for, um, I believe it is after our lab. No problem. A few of you have scheduled for before the class. No problem there. Just come to my office, C124, and we'll get you set up, okay? That's one. Two, what about my lab? Well, here's what I've also offered. For all of you that have the free time to be able to go and take the lab on Thursday, you can come right in, okay? Uh, same conditions, you know, two minutes per station, and then after everybody's gone through all the stations, you can go to the individual stations that you need to go and review. Um, and basically, no muss, no fuss, as long as there's only one person at the station. And um, we're going to basically go through that. Now, for those of you that cannot, do not worry. The setup will be there on next Tuesday. So you'll basically be able to still take the lab practical exam um, on basically what would be next Tuesday. And I think that's March 20th. So don't worry about things. We're going to try to work around this. Mother Nature can hit us, but we can still bounce back. That's what makes us a resilient species. And that's what makes you a winning student. And I'm not kidding. Come on, it takes a lot to, to put the time aside and everything else. Now, that being said, what we're going to do today is finish off Chapter 9, which is the muscular system. Okay? And as I've done before, when I send you a notice, I will include uh, a copy of the lecture notes. So I'd like you to follow along with the printed lecture notes. Also... What I'm going to do is start into chapter 11. Uh, probably, it's better to be a little bit ahead than a little bit behind. Nobody feels the pressure uh, when you're a little bit ahead that they do when you're a little bit behind. Uh, we will continue chapter 11 on Thursday, March 15th, during the lecture part. Okay. I will also include the graphic organizer for the nervous system again, just to help you to get to understand the different types of cells that may, or is a different type of tissues that make up the nervous system. So please print these things out. I'm trying to give you the necessary tools. And I will try to also attach uh, the chapter 11 lecture notes too. Please bring those to class. Okay. So let's move forward with this. Last time we ended at section 12, which was the motor unit. You can see this image on figure 910, page 296. Let's move. Now, what is a motor unit? Motor unit consists of a motor neuron, and all the muscle fibers it supplies. Now, by the way, when we get into the next last section, or the, the third section of uh, the labs, we're gonna focus on one lab uh, focusing on the muscular system. We will also have an image, a microscopic image, very similar to what you see on the right side there, stained so that you can see the branching axon to the motor unit. You will uh, also have um, several other sections that we will focus in on the nervous system, particularly the central nervous system, cranial nerves, and uh, the spinal cord. But that's after this lab practical exam, so don't sweat it, okay? Now, one of the things, as I said, you've got a motor neuron and all the muscle fibers it supplies. Why is that so important? Well, you see, each muscle is served by at least one motor neuron. Now, the, that may contain hundreds of motor neuron axons. Here's the trick. The finer the detail of muscle control, the smaller the motor unit. So to help you to think about it this way, um, you know, you're going to have a motor um, unit for something like your thigh muscle, and that will cover basically lots and lots of muscle fibers. But something as finely detailed as, let's say, the eye or the uh, lips that may not have a motor unit that has hundreds of fibers. It may be much more uh, reduced the number of fibers. Why? Because if you want fine detail control, 
you're going to have individual muscle muscle uh, motor neurons that are going to control smaller batches smaller numbers of nerve fibers okay now let's go over here let's talk about the muscle twitch now the muscle twitch consists of three distinct phases first the latent phase period of contraction then finally the period of relaxation so what's the latent phase the first few milliseconds after stimulation you notice on this chart going from left to right okay now the y-axis that's the vertical axis of the percentage of maximum tension the x-axis which is the horizontal axis is the time now ms stands for milliseconds so thousands of seconds okay one one thousandths two one thousandths three one thousandths so you have an individual stimulus at time zero notice for the first couple of milliseconds you're going to have excitation contraction starting but you're not going to see any change in the myogram muscle tension will begin and then we start moving into the period of contraction and you start seeing the contraction the uh, maximum uh, percentage increasing that's the period of contraction so you're going to have cross bridges that are going to be very active myogram tracing rises this period is going to last from 10 to 100 milliseconds okay in this case what we've got is it's going to continue till about about 30 milliseconds on the on the diagram that you see right here okay the tension and that's also referred to as the pull overcomes the resistance to the load think of it this way you have to kind of build up some contraction before you can lift the weight or lift the arm the arm could be the weight okay it's not talking about superman and picking up the back end of a car it's literally just putting your hand on something and beginning to build up tension okay you may not move it but you're going to definitely build up some pull and we'll show you the difference between several of these situations in a few minutes but right now keep this in mind you've got tension overcoming resistance to the load the muscle is going to start shorting and it's shortening in length because the sarcomeres are all been starting to contract now what about the period relaxation this will last anywhere from 10 to 100 milliseconds in this case what you see wow it's about based on the slope and everything else you're going about almost 110 milliseconds okay about 100 milliseconds okay so it starts with the re-entry of the calcium ions into the sarcoplasmic reticulum remember that we said sarcoplasmic reticulum releases this calcium so when does it actually stop when you start uptaking again the calcium calcium is not going to be as available remember calcium is necessary to attach to troponin so it causes tropomyosin to move which exposes the actin binding sites which allows the myosin heads to bind to the actin binding sites when the calcium levels start beginning to drop that's when you're going to start having a reduction in the contractile force the muscle tension will decrease to zero the muscle will return to normal length now muscle contractions can be graded in two ways <laughs> excuse me you can change the frequency of stimulation you can change the strength of stimulation so what do we mean by that if you take a look here you have increased times of stimuli can cause a wave summation or what they refer to as fused tetanus tetanus is basically the contraction and it in a fused tetanus refers to sustained complete it can't contract any further the tension cannot increase but the tension stays sustained start from the upper left hand corner you see there's stimulus contraction relaxation yeah that's one little stimulus single single stimulus and a single twitch okay now what happens if you started having a stimulus before you went through complete relaxation so stimulus contraction partial relaxation stimulus again and then you're going to contract even further and then you start relaxing and then a stimulus again and that's going to push even more relaxation and it's going to go back and forth back and forth until you get your peak contractile possibility and then you stop doing the stimulus and then it goes through that long slope this is referred to as unfused or incomplete tetanus now 
let's go back and do stimulus, 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 stimulus. And by the way, stimulus can be just electrical impulses. They can be certain reactions. You can use other types of stimulus. Remember we said that the uh, sarcoplasm is responsive to different types of stimuli. So make it real, make it real simple. As you keep bombarding it with stimulus, you continue to have this rise in tension until it basically hits a plateau. That's the flattened area. High st stimulus frequency, fused complete tetanus. So what do you have there? At the higher stimulus frequencies, there's no relaxation at all between stimuli. This is the fused or complete tetanus. Now, some people get tetanus mistaken with the disease tetanus. Where does this actually come from? We'll talk a little bit about it, but I'll just give you a short thumbnail sketch. There's a bacterial disease called tetanus. It releases a toxin. The toxin causes the muscles to completely uh, contract, and there's no conscious way to relax them. Okay, if you're interested, you can take my microbiology course because it gets interesting. Why do we take a tetanus vaccine as adults? because we have to keep getting a rebooster every eight to 10 years to keep resistant against a tetanus infection. And sadly, as adults get older, they think, oh, that's for kids. And yet then there's a higher risk, and it's been recorded, of cases of tetanus occurring 40s, 50s, and 60s. Why? Because they stopped taking their booster. And then they got an infection that led to the actual disease, Clostridium tetani, the bacteria, which eventually led to the release of the toxins, the tetanotoxin, and that release caused the muscles to, tet to basically go into complete tetanus, okay? We'll get more into that later on. Don't panic if you don't get it all now. We want you to get the basic points, the change of frequency of stimulation. Now, we can also change the strength of stimulation. Now, what do I mean by that? You'll notice I once in a while will say this, that action potentials have that one particular peak and then come down, etc. Okay, but what if you had an intensity, an increase in the maximum amount of stimulus? What happens is, think about it from this perspective. You're going to uh, control more precisely the recruitment. You're going to have multiple motor units uh, stimulated and they are going to summate. Now here's the idea. Look at the top. The top here you have the stimulus voltage and the stimuli to the nerve. Notice that you've got to get a threshold. You've got to get some amount that's going to cause uh, basically the contraction. But if you keep increasing the stimuli to the, to the nerve, you get to a maximum stimulus. Now what's translated to? Look at the center one. Every one of the dark dots are um, muscle fibers that are getting involved with the excitation and with the contraction. Go from left to right. Left, there's nothing. As you move progressively toward the right, you notice that there's more and more and more, and eventually you get to the point in the last four circles that all of the, the um, motor units have been excited and all of those muscle fibers are all contracting. That's the point of maximum contraction, as you can see in the time in the last, at the lowest chart, okay? So the force of contraction, you can control it more precisely by recruitment, by bringing in more muscle fibers, okay? Now, the main point, if you really want to get everything uh, at, at a really quick and intense boost, the maximum stimulus yield means that you're going to have to have all the muscle motor units recruited. So you're going to have to have all of the nerves of the motor units firing to get all of those muscle fibers to contract all at the same time to give you the maximum contraction. Okay. Now we've got to talk about uh, some of the other muscle contraction principles. By the way, this is a good chart that also explains what we just talked about. Motor unit one recruits small fibers. Motor unit two recruited, medium fibers get involved. Motor unit three recruited, large fibers get involved. And what do you notice? You get this exceedingly great buildup of contraction. But some of the other points you need to keep in mind. When we talk about muscle tension, this is the force exerted by a contracting muscle. Load, that's the opposing force exerted on the muscle 
by the weight of the object to be moved. You know, like I gave the analogy of Superman and lifting the car up. Okay, fine. The car's weight is the load. The muscle tension to basically move that uh, object has to have an incredible large amount of muscle tension. Now, loads don't always move, and also muscles do not always shorten. And this is something that you have to get in mind. What do I mean by that? We're going to talk about two different types of contraction, isometric, isotonic. Now, if you remember iso, that was a prefix I talked about once before. Iso means same. With the word isometric, metric would refer to length. Okay, so you're talking about no change in length. Does that mean there would be any change in the tone or load? Yes, there will be. So if it helps you, isotonic means no change in length, but an increase in the muscle contraction force or the load. Okay, isotonic contraction, that's the same tone or load. Okay, and you're still maintaining a sustained force. Now that might get a little confusing and I may have said it a little bit awkward here. So let me give you an idea. Isometric contraction. Here I'm going to go forward here. In isometric contraction, the contracting muscle doesn't change its length, but it builds up an increase in tension. The cross bridges are generating force, but they're not moving along the thin filaments. So what happens is that although the metric, the length of the muscle doesn't change, it is still building up a greater and greater force. It can't shorten because of the load that's present. If you go back one, blip, here you have isotonic contraction. You have the same tone or load. The contracting muscle changes length, but the tension stays the same. The cross bridges are generating consistent force as they are moving along the thin filaments. Okay, so if you want to think about it this way, you ever seen somebody do isotonic exercises before? They call them stretching exercises before they go running. Okay, fine. So they're pushing up against something that's obviously not going to move. You push up against a wall, the wall of a building, a tree, something else like that. But they're trying to build up some contraction to get the muscles going and also to get the blood moving through those muscles so that when they do the run, they have a much better effective delivery of oxygen and nutrients to those skeletal muscles and then uh, removal of the waste of the exercising muscles. Now, let's go back on one other thing here. We talked about myograms a few minutes ago. You saw one of those. Myograms are great for detecting uh, muscle tone, but what are myograms? They're an apparatus that measures the muscle's mechanical contractile activity. So what you see is what? Y-axis measurement of maximum tension, X-axis amount of time. So they are very, very sensitive in um, the time timing as well as the measurement of the tension okay so the line recording of an activity is called a tracing the response of a muscle to a single brief threshold stimulus is called a muscle twitch now muscle tone this is the slightly contracted state due to spinal nerve reflexes to maintain posture as well as keep muscles ready to respond to further stimulation some of you may have heard of situations where Individuals are not working on their muscle tone. They're standing straight like soldiers. Uh, you may have seen this where somebody will stand there and then they'll pass out. Boom! The face down. You'll get a little bit more of this when you get into A and P too, but let me give you a pointer about this. Most soldiers that are experienced, okay, in this situation of standing straight as an honor guard or something else, you know, diplomatic leaders are coming through, they know that although the pants stay straight, Inside, they're kind of twitching their muscles a little bit. Why? Here's the trick, and it relates to cardiovascular. Your legs have to basically contract periodically to squeeze the venous supply of blood up into the abdomen and eventually back to the heart. If you don't do this, you will pass out because the blood supply to the brain will eventually be decreased. A lot more blood is in the lower extremities. You got to keep it from staying in the lower extremities. That's why we move around. But soldiers standing still, if they don't twitch the muscles, they're going to have a buildup in the venous supply of blood in the lower extremities and a reduction in, in blood pressure. 
in the brain part, and that's when they go bloop and fall down. If that's not totally clear, I'd be very happy to demonstrate it next time. And no, no students will be involved. I'll demonstrate myself. Yes, just make sure that there's a nice comfy pillow on the floor. Let's move forward. Okay, <clears throat> so we've talked about this. Let's talk about muscle uh, metabolism. Muscle metabolism. Now, look, I've said this before. You have to have ATP. That's the big cellular currency. But the muscle stores of ATP are very limited. In other words, right now, as you're sitting there probably watching this, you've got maybe about four to six seconds worth of ATP. And remember, we're talking about the breakdown of ATP. is It's a, a basically a hydrolysis of ATP. You break off a of phosphate, now have ADP, adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, and PI, which is the inorganic phosphate. To regenerate it, you've got to reverse the reaction. ADP plus PI gives you ATP. Now, there's three ways to basically make ATP. Some of them are efficient, some of them are not. When you talk about direct phosphorylation from creatine phosphate, this supplies the, the phosphate group to ADP to create ATP. Okay, sounds good. So this is a direct phosphorylation method, and you have an enzyme that is called creatine kinase. But guess what? doesn't produce you a lot, okay? The CP that you see on the left-hand side with ADP, that's creatine phosphate. It's going to, with the help of creatine kinase, the enzyme, hand over the phosphate to make ADP to ATP. So the, you'll now have three phosphates attached to adenosine triphosphate. Creatine is out. Now, by the way, <clears throat> It only produces about 15 seconds of ATP. It doesn't produce tons and tons. So if you go to those muscle shops, you go to those health stores, they'll say creatine is the best thing in the world. And as I would go over this with my muscle physiology professors, they would just sit there and go, baloney. You'd do better if you bought yourself a nice steak. You're buying high quality creatine for a very short return. A aerobic. Me uh, metabolism. Aerobic means with oxygen. This is using oxidative phosphorylation, which requires oxygen and the mitochondrial enzymes. The process converts glucose or fatty acids or amino acids to ATP. Just to help you, one glucose molecule will yield about 32 to 36 ATPs, and the process can provide hours and hours of ATP. That's why it's key to have uh, an active delivery of oxygen and glucose to those muscles. Okay, we're talking skeletal muscles now. Anaerobic, and the AN before the aerobic means not oxygenation. This is a process that's very inefficient. Using glucose, and the process occurs in the cell cytoplasm, the process will yield two ATP molecules and two molecules of lactic acid. Lactic acid is the rest of the molecule of glucose, and that's what you end up with, inefficient conversion of glucose to ATP. Lactic acid, remember, will drop pH. Lactic acid is converted from pyruvic acid. Lactic acid gets delivered into the blood. Now, this is going to, if you had too much of a buildup, create a decrease in pH, and that's where you would start having the, uh, it would affect the function of many uh, enzymes and other things. Fortunately, lactic acid can be transported from the muscle cell via the blood to the liver where it can be converted to glucose. This is a process called the Cori cycle. You need to know that. C-O-R-I, Cori. This process requires ATP to convert lactic acid molecule to glucose. Lactic acid is also a fuel source, though, for the liver, kidney, and heart cells. Okay, so that's good, but the thing you got to keep in mind is that lactic acid buildup will alter the pH of the muscle cell, the blood, etc., and changes in pH, which would mean the pH would begin to drop, can alter enzyme activity, protein structure, etc. Everybody got that so far? Good. Here's the thing. People will talk about aerobic endurance and anaerobic threshold. Aerobic endurance is the length of time a muscle cell can continue to contract using aerobic pathways. You'll probably talk to people who are marathon runners or, or just 
uh, uh, for exercise purposes. They run a lot. They'll talk about hitting the wall. Anaerobic threshold, this is the point in which muscular activity, the, the point of muscular activity, where the muscle metabolism converts from aerobic to anaerobic. Muscles working at peak levels anaerobically fatigue within one to two minutes. Here's the main point. There is a finite limit, no matter how athletic you are, no matter how in good shape, no matter how in bad shape you are, where you'll start going, oh, I got a stitch in my, my, my chest or my muscles, I got a cramp, I got this, I got that. That's usually when the blood supply that delivers oxygen and glucose has hit its maximum level. When it hits that, the muscles will begin to start going from aerobic to anaerobic. When they go to anaerobic, you've only got a short time before the buildup of lactic acid occurs, starts accounting for things like the stitch in your chest or, or your stitch in your side or your cramps, etc. In other words, you start having muscle fatigue. And the state of physiological inability to contract is referred to as muscle fatigue. This is when the muscle activity goes anaerobically too long. Now, there is a term that Informally, it was called oxygen debt or oxygen deficit. It's called the excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption, EPOC. This is the excess, the extra amount of oxygen taken in by the body for restoration after anaerobic glycolysis process has occurred. For a little drama, this is when you sit there and you've got somebody, like myself, who would be sitting there after the end of a long run going, <sighs> <sighs> ventilating excessively, and that's because they're trying to rebuild back some of the oxygen to basically shift the system to meet its needs because you've been on anaerobic for a while, okay? So this represents the difference between the amount of oxygen needed for total, ana uh, total aerobic activity and the amount actually used. Um, so basically, you can see this. You know, somebody is just, you know, we uh, whizzing away, uh, just basically um, sucking in a lot of wind and etc. And this is after they have done whatever is necessary to run. Okay. Here is an example of the short term exercise, short duration exercise, prolonged duration exercise. Okay. A couple little pointers here to help you. If you notice, you start off first six seconds. Okay. That's all the ATP stored in the muscles. Boom. Gone. Next, 10 seconds. That's the ATP that's formed from creatine phosphate and ADP. Boom, gone. Now you're going 30, 40 seconds and then to the end of the exercise. That's where the glycogen stored in the muscles. Remember we talked about this glycogen granules that exist in muscles? Okay, that's your stored fuel. Glycogen is what? A polymer. What is it made up of? Individual glucose molecules. What does that do? They're broken down and then they're, they're, they're put into being oxidized to generate the ATP. So what? then would be the limit. Probably the blood delivery of any extra glucose that could be delivered, as well as the oxygen. When your uh, uh, basically circulatory system comes to a maximum of delivering oxygen, any further activity beyond that starts popping over from aerobic to anaerobic. The post, the prolonged duration exercise, if you have that, that's ATP is being generated by breakdown of several nutrient energy fuels by aerobic pathways. The pathways use oxygen uh, released from the myoglobin and released from the blood from hemoglobin. When this ends, the oxygen deficit is paid back. So think about this. If I've been pumping out and using myoglobin to deliver oxygen, et cetera, what's going to happen? When you start getting toward that, you know, huffing and puffing toward the end or, or afterwards, what are you doing? You're actually trying to get and, and redeposit some of the oxygen into the myoglobin muscles, okay? What you also have to keep in mind is this. Now we're coming up to Patriots Day, right? And in Boston, we're well known for our marathons. What do they have before the weekend? We can have big pasta festivals. What are they doing? Num, 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 lots of spaghetti, lots of pasta. And Prince Spaghetti uh, was one of the big supporters of the uh, marathon. Here's the main point. When marathoners get ready for a race, they start doing a step-by-step -step process. They have a, you know, they go through so much exercise and then they start cutting down on a little bit of the exercise by increasing their carbohydrate increase. Why the carbohydrate increase? Because the starch, which is made of long chains of glucose, 
those starches they consume in the days before the, the actual race gets converted into glycogen stored in the skeletal muscles, stored in the liver. Okay? Remember, the liver will also be a major uh, site to store glycogen in granules, and that when the body requires that the glucose, uh, the liver gets hormonal signals that trigger the release, the breakdown of the glycogen into glucose, and the glucose gets transported back into the blood. I hope that helps. Now, let's talk about the force of contraction. This can be affected by the following. Number of muscle fibers contracting, relative size of the muscle, series of elastic elements. This is, you know, that is the non-contractile elements present, so tendons, ligaments, etc. okay? And the degrees of the muscle stretch. When you look at that, the degrees of the muscle stretch, the optimum operational length is 80 to 120% of normal resting length. Go back here. If you take a look here, this is the percentage of resting sarcomere length. Okay, and with percentages on the bottom, on the vertical axis, the y-axis, that's the tension. Now, if you notice at 75%, the sarcomeres have already been greatly shortened, so you really are not going to get a lot more contraction there. If you look on the very far right, you've got 170% excessively stretched. Notice that there's very few myosin heads that are now in contact with the actin thin filaments. When you get in the middle, you know, it's kind of like Goldilocks, you know, this bed is too hard, this one's too soft, this one's just right. Okay. The sarcomeres at resting length of 100% is the Goldilocks happy camper limb. And what I mean by that is, if you notice, all of the myosin heads have some contact with the actin filaments, but they can still contract further and bring the sarcomere to a greater uh, contraction. And so that's where, really, this is where the degrees of muscle stretch occur. A couple of other terms to be familiarized with. Hypertrophy. This is the increase in the size of the muscle cell. Regular exercise can bring about hypertrophy. Now, we're coming up to table 9.2. This is another one of these goodies that I would like you to hot peg and use as a, sort of a quick review. There are factors that influence the velocity and duration of skeletal muscle contraction, okay? And the two major factors are the speed of contraction and the major pathways of forming ATP, okay? Now, the speed of contraction is determined by the speed, the ATPase to split ATP. So you're going to have some of the fibers are referred to as slow fibers. Others are referred to as fast fibers. And this is all determined by the particular enzyme, ATPase. So how quickly can it basically uh, hydrolyze ATP to ADP and PI? Also, the other major pathway for forming ATP, that's the other aspect of uh, muscle, skeletal muscle cell contraction. And that is, does it primarily go through oxidative uh, formation? So you have aerobic pathways to generate ATP, or does it do glycolytic? Glycolytic, remember, is really involving anaerobic glycolysis. Now, what you really have are three major fiber types. Okay. Now, the slow oxidative fiber, you can tell it's red in color, which means it has a high myoglobin content. It has many mitochondria. Why? Because those mitochondria are going to be actively producing ATP. It is slow to fatigue. Well, that's because basically it's just churning away ATP as the demand goes on. These are muscle fibers that are good for endurance exercise. Now, we then have another type that's sort of like an in-between, fast oxidative fibers. They're red to pink in color. They have a fast contractile speed, but they have an intermediate myoglobin content. So it's sort of not the slow, but not, not the slow oxidative, but not the fast uh, glycolytic, okay? It's got many mitochondria. It is an intermediate fatigue rate. So it's great for speed exercise. So the first one you had, Slow oxidative, those are great for like marathons. Fast oxidative fibers, those are great if you were going to be like the 50-yard dash, the 100-yard dash. The fast glycolytic fibers, they're white in color. 
Oh, that must mean that they are, and yes, it's true, low in their myoglobin content. They have a fast contraction speed, but they have very few mitochondria. They're fast to fatigue. They're great for intense contractile force for exercise. So think about it this way. Type A, great for marathoners. Type B, great for those uh, short distance runners. Type C, these are the guys that you'd see they they do, uh, for example, the, the weights. In the Olympics, remember they do the fast pull up, the jerk, put it over their head, and then they drop it. That's all that they need to do. So the muscle activity and exercise are dependent on different muscle fiber content. So when we get into exercise for a second, this is where you would be getting students asking questions about this. Aerobic. Aerobic exercise favors slow oxidative fibers, increases the myoglobin synthesis, my mitochondria numbers, and capillary development. Hey, remember capillaries are important because that's the delivery point uh, from the blood to the tissues itself. You're also going to have with aerobic increased endurance and resistance to fatigue. Now, for resistance, that is anaerobic exercise, that favors the anaerobic metabolism, strength, not stamina, favors fast glycolytic fibers. The size of the muscle fibers will increase. You will get some splitting and tearing of fibers that may occur, and glycogen storage increases. Now, what if you were somebody that favored cross-training, alternating between aerobic and anaerobic? This has been referred to as best program for optimal health. And then we finally get into one other point, disuse atrophy. This is loss of muscle mass due to disuse. Muscle mass can eventually uh, be replaced by fibrous connective tissue, which I talked to you about before. And all the wonderful things that have occurred in 100 years, one of the things is we try to get people back on their feet as quickly as possible to reduce the chance of disuse atrophy, okay? Now, if somebody has uh, those muscles being, you know, kind of restricted from movement because they're in a cast, you want to try to get them to move as quickly as possible afterwards, and that's where they may need some physical therapy, okay? All right, let us now move into smooth muscle. Remember we said we were going to cover a lot about skeletal muscle, a moderate amount about smooth muscle, and a little bit about cardiac muscle, which you'll get more of in um, AP2. Smooth muscle. This is present in hollow organs. It, they are spindle-shaped muscles. They are organized into sheets of opposed fibers. So in other words, you might get one layer that's going to be circular, one layer that's going to be longitudinal, and that's why they're opposed. This is a, as you can see here, we've got an example of the small intestine. And the longitudinal layer, these fibers will run parallel to the long axis of the organ. So when the organ contracts, then the muscle's layer will dilate and shorten. When you have a circular layer, these are the fibers that run around the circumference of the organ. Contraction of this muscle layer will constrict the lumen. Now the lumen, remember, is that open area, okay? and the organ will elongate. Now, if you remember what peristalsis is, this is the progressive wave-like uh, movement that occurs in these hollow tube-like structures. This is necessary to help push products that are in the lumen, in the central space there, of these tube-like structures, down, up, sideways, whatever is necessary. And you, therefore, there's one other point to help you here. They're gonna be rich in ner nervous system fibers to allow for the coordinated occurrence of, you know, squeezing, relaxation, uh, contraction, etc. So, peristalsis, progressive wave-like contractions that move materials through the tube-like, that is, hollow body organs. Now, you can see what we've got here. Let's take a look at the microanatomy, though. In microanatomy, it's differing, it differs from the motor units you see with skeletal muscle. The neural connections, these are innervating fibers that are part of the autonomic nervous system, not the voluntary conscious nervous system, referred to, otherwise referred to as somatic nervous system. Also, the thing is they have bulbous swellings that they're called varicosities. If you take a look at the varicosities, this is where you're going to have the release of the neurotransmitter, but it's not um, in a very 
defined synapse. It's in a wide synaptic cleft. So this allows for a diffuse release, okay? And these are referred to as diffuse junctions, and they kind of rain down onto a series of the, the smooth muscle cells. Oh, by the way, remember that smooth muscle cells do not have uh, striations, whereas cardiac and skeletal do. Now, moving on. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is less developed and T-tubules are absent. That only makes sense. You don't need T-tubules here. The cavioli, which we're going to go into the next area, here you can see them, they're right in the edges of the cell membrane. These are pouch-like infoldings of the smooth muscle cell membrane, and they hold extracellular fluid that contains high concentrations of calcium ions. Now, upon stimulation, the calcium ions will flow in from the sarco sarcoplasmic reticulum and via the calcium ion channels in the caviole. It's not alveoli, it's caviole membrane. Now, there's one other thing that you're going to notice. There's no troponin. You have a modified tropomyosin, and that lies next to the thin filaments. There are no striations, as I said to you before, and the thick and the th th thick and thin filaments are arranged diagonally in the cell in a spiral format, which accounts for, if you look at that contracted smooth mu muscle fiber, it's kind of like it's kind of as if you twisted it and shrunk it. You can even see the nucleus, how it's kind of in a spiral format there, you know. And so the ratio of thick to thin filaments is 1 to 13. Keep in mind that the skeletal is 1 to 2. Also, the thick filaments are loaded with actin binding heads all along the, the entire length. It's very different from what you see where it's almost like a hockey stick. Remember that it was kind of like you got a couple of heads at the end, and you have this long strand that makes up the myosin. Not here. It's just loaded all over the place with them. So it can grip in all different directions. OK, but it provides more gripping and more contractile power. Now, let's talk about contraction steps. If you notice on the top of here, and I'm going to jump through these. First thing you've got to have is calcium ions entering. So the ionic calciums come in, but they bind to not to uh, any troponin. They bind to a protein called calmodulin. And the contraction may be coordinated with neighboring smooth muscle cells via gap junction. So there's another point you want to keep in mind. So when the calcium binds to the calmodulin, you get an activated calmodulin. The activated calmodulin activates myosin light chain kinase, MLCK. In other words, it's another protein that gets activated. Once that's activated, and this is a cascade event, folks, to help you, then it catalyzes phosphate from ATP to act on the myosin cross bridges. Now, notice this. The phosphate gets attached to the myosin molecule. You now have a phosphorylated cross bridges interact with the actin thin filaments. There you are. And the muscle will contract. What stops it? Well, muscle contractions stop as the intercellular calcium levels drop. So what happens is you've got to have these taken out, and that's where the sarcoplasmic reticulum plays a role, okay? Calcium ion reuptake by the sarcoplasmic reticulum and transport out of the cell membrane occurs. Now, you've got to keep in mind a couple of other things here. There's always a few unique systems that exist. Some smooth muscle fibers in the stomach and small intestine will act like pacemaker cells. They will be self-excitatory. They will set the pace of contraction for the entire muscle sheet. Okay? Now, a couple of other points as we start running down to the end. One of the things you're going to also see is that intermediate filaments and dense bodies. If we go back here, Notice that those structures are there. They're attached to the sarcolemma. They are going to harness the pull generated by the myosin cross bridges. So they're going to play a key point. Notice that there are also gap junctions on that cell. That's going to help synchronize all of the muscle cells beginning to contract at the same time. Now, there are some similarities. There are some differences between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. 
The similarities are that actin and myosin are interacting using the sliding filament mechanism. The final trigger is intracellular calcium ion levels. The sliding process uses ATP. The contraction of smooth muscles, though, is slow, sustained, and resistant to fatigue. You got to keep in mind that smooth muscles have low energy requirements and the respiration is mostly anaerobic. There are anaerobic pathways to produce ATP and therefore there's fewer mitochondria that are present. What will regulate some of these processes? Mostly specific neurotransmitters and this depends on the neurotransmitter receptor to initiate the smooth muscle contractions. Contraction or relaxation can occur via low oxygen, low pH, carbon dioxide, or certain hormones, just to help you. If you've had a lot of activity, you're going to use up the oxygen, okay? What could cause the low pH? Build up lactic acid. What could cause the lower pH? Build up a carbon dioxide. What can cause the um, contraction or relaxation can also occur by certain hormones. This is particularly true when you start talking about the gut system. We're gonna talk about eventually the enteric nervous system they found that there are certain hormones that are present that normally would be found, for example, in the brain, but they're found also in the gut. That is to allow for uh, coordinated contraction. And some of these actually play a role in other functions, such as the release of certain enzymes or acids in the function of the stomach or small intestine. We'll get more into that later on. And as we move forward here, wait a minute. I wanted to go back one. Here we go. There are major types of smooth muscles, and I encourage you to review page 313. There is the visceral or unitary, otherwise known as single unit, and then the multi-unit. How are they different? Well, the smooth muscles for single unit are arranged in opposing, that is, opposite sheets, longitudinal versus circular. The cells contract as a unit. They contract rhythmically. The cells are electrically coupled together via gap junctions. They exhibit spontaneous action potentials, and they're found in the digestive tract. Multi-unit, these are different. They are found in large airways, large arteries, the iris muscles, the erector pili. Remember those? Those are attached to the uh, hair follicles. The gap junctions in multi-unit are rare. Their spontaneous and synchronized depolarizations are rare. They consist of muscle fibers that are structurally independent. They're richly innervated. They respond to neural stimulation with graded contractions. So contractions are based on frequency and intensity of the neural stimuli. So a little, you get a little contraction. A lot of stimulation, a lot more intensity of contraction. Similar to what you saw in the skeletal muscles. Before we go, and I do encourage you to review table 9.3, just want to pass on a couple of uh, uh, pathology notes. Muscular dystrophy. This is a group of inherited muscle-destroying diseases. The affected muscles degenerate and are replaced by fat and connective tissue deposits. Now, I remember in, uh, I was in medical school in 85, and it hit the fan where they finally found the gene for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And uh, this was really incredible. Uh, you know, the student, the graduate student that was doing the work on it um, was actually in the local area and everybody was a buzz about it. This is a sex-linked recessive disease. In other words, it's on the X chromosome. It appears in children and causes the muscles to degenerate. The victims li rarely live beyond early 20s and it's due to respiratory failure. Okay, remember the respiratory system has skeletal muscles. They are in between the ribs. Those are called the intercostals. And then also you have that huge sheet that is called the diaphragm. Okay. The gene defect is in the dystrophin protein. To help you remember, dystrophin helps attach uh, the con contractile mechanisms to the sarcolemma. So when this protein fails, the sarcolemma begins to tear during the contraction, leading to the actual programmed death, the apoptosis of the muscle cells and the subsequent decrease in the muscle mass, okay? As we start running down to the end, I do encourage you to read the anabolic steroid article on 315. Review the clinical terms. Now, by now you know that I do bring up uh, exam questions on the clinical terms, and I try to keep this important and related to 
your future in healthcare as a nurse. Okay, so you want to review the system connections, review the chapter summary, and review the graphic organizer on muscle types. Remember this one? Yep, I'm sure you do. So take time to review it. It would be fruitful for you. And keep that handy when you get into the lab uh, after this next lab practical, because it'll help you to distinguish and, and review the difference between skeletal, cardiac, and smooth. Next, we're going to go into is chapter 11, the nervous system. With this, I'm going to move into the nervous system for a short bit. As I said, I will include the nervous system just to get a little bit ahead, not too far, but ahead somewhat. And uh, it's important that you start reading it now, chapter 11. Okay? Now, the nervous system is a fast-acting control system that triggers muscle contraction or gland secretion. Look, this is the system. This is one of the primary systems that allows for homeostasis. Remember that word? Go back to chapter one. Review it. You've got three overlapping functions here. Sensory input, integration, motor output. Now, you got to keep in mind, sensory input, intake of sensory stimuli. It's cold outside. Therefore, my body is going to have to work on maintaining the body temperature despite being cold. Integration. We're going to process the stimuli, the input, and then decide if there's a response necessary. If you remember that, we talked about that. What if you walked outside right now and it's snowy out and you didn't have barely anything but a t-shirt on. Well, your sensory input would tell you, hey, it's cold. The skin is detecting a very low temperature. The integration center in the brain would begin to say, look, I've got to maintain body temperature, so I'm going to have issue an output. The motor output here would be rapid muscle contractions of the skeletal muscle to basically just generate heat. We call it shivering. Now, neurons are highly irritable. Doesn't mean they're cranky. It just means that they, the term means that they respond to stimuli. I always throw that joke in and it gets bad after a while. I know. When you look at the organization, you want to look at figure 11.2. When we talk about the um, nervous system, it's divided into two major parts. The central nervous system, CNS, which is consisting of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system, the PNS. These are nerves outside of the CNS. So. When we get into the chart, you'll see this again, but the peripheral nervous system, those are the nerves all outside the, cent the central nervous system, and they're divided into sensory and motor, and there's further subdivisions from there. When you talk about the sensory, that's the afferent pathways, pathways heading toward the brain, to the CNS, to the brain and spinal cord. They carry information toward the CNS. You have somatic afferent, which is the nerves from the skin, skeletal muscle, joints. You have visceral afferent, which is information from the visceral organs. You have motor. Now, these are the pathways carrying information away from the CNS, the central nervous system. Efferent always says carry away. So, nerve fibers can be divided into two classes there. The somatic nervous system, that is the voluntary nervous system, for example, controlling skeletal muscles. The autonomic nervous system, ANS, that is also known as the involuntary nervous system. It controls smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, glands. Now, the autonomic nervous system we're going to study in it extensively uh, in Chapter 14. I want you to be aware of that because, you see, that's going to connect also to some of the pharmacology that you are going to be picking up over the next so many uh, months in your various courses, okay? Not only in AP2, not only in micro, but also in the nursing courses. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two subdivisions, parasympathetic and sympathetic, okay? We'll get more into that later on. So let's take a look here. Um, here you have someone that sees, so that's a visual, uh, that's a sensory system, and they see the image of a water. The sensory input brings it to the brain. The brain is the integration center, so you make some decisions and you send out certain motor output to eventually grasp and pick up the glass of water. So that's a very simplified version there. As you can see here, the nervous system consists of both CNS and PNS. Central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, 
It is integrative and control centers. Peripheral nervous system consists of cranial nerves, spinal nerves, communication lines between the central nervous system and the rest of the body. The PNS is divided into the sensory, that's the afferent division, and the motor, which is the efferent division. So afferent division, this is going to get all the somatic and visceral information. You know, you might get, you know, a pain in your gut because you had too much chili peppers, or you're going to get uh, basically that chill and your skin sensory afferents are going to pass that information up to the, the uh, central nervous system. Motor efferent division, that's the motor nerve fibers, conducts impulses from the CNS to effectors. And that's going to be subdivided into the somatic nervous system. That's going to be the voluntary control. The autonomic nervous system, that's the involuntary control. Okay. And then there's two subdivisions of the autonomic, which we'll go into later on. The sympathetic division, which mobilizes the body systems during activity, such as exercise uh, or a threat or something like that. And the parasympathetic, which is involved with conserving energy and promoting housekeeping functions during rest. That includes, of course, uh, processing a, a meal that's been consumed or basically uh, things like bowel movements and stuff like that. Let's go to the histology for a few minutes. <clears throat> this is in figure 11.4. Uh, You've got to keep in mind that the nervous system is composed of neurons and neuroglia. This is where I encourage you to review the concept map on the various types of cells. Now, in the central nervous system, there's a unique set. First is the astrocytes. They are the most abundant cell type. They have pseudopodia extension, so in other words, part of their cytoplasm uh, and part of the cell membrane extends from the cell and wraps around structures such as the neuron and the capillaries that are within the central nervous system. They cling to the neurons and the capillaries, and their function is to control substance exchange between blood and neurons. This is where you're going to get the beginning of the structure known as the blood-brain barrier. They control things like the capillary permeability. They control the potassium ion concentration around the neurons, etc. And they also control the neurotransmitter levels around the neurons as well. The next one you're going to find is microglia. Microglia you can't miss because they've got these long, thorny processes. If you look at that cell and you look at those extensions, it looks like thorns. They're not thorns, really. But these cells contain destroyed dead neurons. They convert to macrophages in the event of an infection. You will get sometimes uh, microglia cell uh, plaques. These are areas where if there was some type of thing like a stroke or something else and there's dead neurons, they repopulate the area as well as consume and remove the dead cell material. Okay. Ependymal cells are interesting in that they're squamous or columnar. They're uh, ciliated, so you notice those top extensions there, and they line fluid-filled cavities. They act as a barrier for the cerebral spinal fluid in both the brain and the spinal cord. They also help play a, a key role in keeping the cerebral spinal fluid circulating because their cilia are going to be constantly waving there to keep the fluid moving in certain directions. Finally, in the CNS, you're going to have oligodendrocytes. These wrap around the neurons and provide myelin sheath insulation for neurons. This is only seen in the central nervous system. If you notice, you have in the dead center uh, the nucleus of the cell of the oligodendrocyte, but then it has this extension of its cell membrane and to a point the cytoplasm, and it rolls around nerve fibers, provides insulation, which we're going to get into in, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, this is involved with myelin sheathing, and it acts as an insulator to enhance the speed of action potentials traveling down the length of nerve fibers, okay? Now, oligodendrocytes are only found in the central nervous system. When we get to the peripheral nervous system, we have two major types of cells. One is called satellite cells. They surround the neuron cell bodies in the ganglia, okay? So they kind of wrap around. A ganglia is going to be a cluster of nerve cells found outside of the CNS. So it, it, a ganglia is going to be found 
outside of the brain as well as outside of the spinal cord. Okay? Now, the satellite cells, they're not really sure what their function is. This kind of hypothesis, etc. But let's continue to move on. If you notice the fiber, the nerve fiber, it is wrapped by these cells called Schwann cells. They also play a key role in providing myelin sheathing. The myelin sheathing is absolutely essential for the proper uh, speed at which action potentials will travel down the length of the nerve fiber. We're going to talk more about the nerve fibers in a bit. The interesting thing is that also Schwann cells play a role in the regeneration of nerve fibers, but that's only in the peripheral nervous system. Okay? So to help you to distinguish it, you know when people talk about uh, severed spinal cords and they wish they could find a way to reconnect them, it seems that you can cut certain nerves outside of the spinal cord and you will have a reconnection and a regeneration after a period of time. What plays a key role there is Schwann cells, but Schwann cells do not exist in the spinal cord. And that's one of the reasons why you do not have regeneration of the spinal cord after it's been injured. Finally, we're going to come up to the neurons. <laughs> neurons are weird. What do we mean by that? Well, they're very, very important, but they have some very unique properties. Um, they conduct information via nerve impulses, those are action potentials, from one part of the body to the other. The weird part is that they have an extreme longevity. You don't make, at your age or many other ages, many more neurons. Once they're there, they're there. That's it. They're amitonic. They lose their ability to divide. They don't. And there was recently another study that kind of confirmed that in the brain, at least, you know, it was thought that maybe by the time you get to be an adult, you still may still make some new cells. Uh, and he went, nope, nope. But one study does not make complete scientific dogma. So don't panic about that. Also, um, neurons have a high metabolic rate, which kind of makes sense because they're always traveling with action potentials. They're going to have a certain demand for things like ATP and oxygen and things like that. There are three functional components for uh, a neuron. It has to have a receptive, that is an input region, and that may include the cell membrane of the soma. Soma is another way of saying the cell body as well as on the dendrites. The dendrites are those spiny extensions you see there. They have a conductive component. That conductive part is going to be around what they call the axon hillock. And it's going to travel all the way down on the axon. That's that long strand extending. And then they have to have a secretory output region. Now this output region is where you're going to have the release of, for the most part, neurotransmitters. And that's usually on the axon terminals. That's referred to as the secretory region. Okay? We'll get more into that as time goes on. In the cell body, otherwise it's also referred to as the perikaryon or the soma. This is the biosynthetic center, so it has a nucleus. Notice you're going to have a nucleoli or a nucleolus present. You will have, interestingly enough, no centrioles. Well, that only makes sense because no mitosis, you don't need centrioles. You do have quite a hefty amount of rough endoplasmic reticulum, RER. They're actually, the way they stain, they're referred to as nissel bodies. They stain usually very, very darkly. They're very active, and you have to basically produce a lot of proteins for various things, enzymes, etc. You will also have a Golgi apparatus present, and you will have, of course, the standard things, mitochondria microtubules, neural fibrils, which are really just intermediate filaments present. And some of them travel and, and basically exist all the way down the length of the axon. Now, as I mentioned to you before, a cluster of cell bodies in the ganglia is called, in the PNS is referred to as a ganglia. There are areas where you're going to have in the brain clusters of these cell bodies, and they're referred to as nuclei. So in the CNS, clusters of cell bodies are nuclei. In the PNS, clusters of cell bodies are called ganglia. What about the processes? Well, these are arm-like structures extending from the cell body. 
In the CNS, they contain both soma and processes. In the PNS, most of the time you just have extensions. There's very little soma, uh, at, and mostly that's going to be at the ganglion sites. Mostly when you get into the peripheral nervous system, you see these long strands of axon. Yes, there are axons that travel three to four feet length. Okay? Also, the bundles of neuron processes have different names. If you have a bundle of neuron processes, a bunch of these uh, extended axons, in the central nervous system, they're referred to as tracks. In the peripheral nervous system, we call them nerves. So the nerves that travel down through the shoulder into the arm and then eventually innervate the muscles there, those are referred to as nerves. What about the types of processes? Well, dendrites versus axons. Dendrites, these are short. They taper. They may be branched. They're the main receptor. That is, they allow input of information, either from other cells, from other neurons, etc. So they're the main receptive region. They are not myelinated. You are not going to find Schwann cells there. The dendritic spine, these are thorny appendages with bulbous ends. They allow for close contact with other neurons. The dendrite input is conveyed toward the body. So in other words, when we talk about later on, we're going to be talking about depolarizations, etc. All of the input is going to be headed toward the cell body. And the electrical signals are in the form of graded potentials. Axons. They arise from the axon hillock. Think of it as sort of like a funnel or a cone, the axon hillock. And it summates and basically makes a decision whether an action potential is generated or not, and will travel down that axon. Okay? So it's the trigger zone for the action potentials. Uh, the axons link, they, vary. they can be very, very, very short, millimeter or less, or they can be very long, three to four feet long. Also, some neurons do not have an axon. A very long axon is called a nerve fiber. Axon collaterals, these are branches that you might see. So if I can give you an idea about a branch, if you take a look, here would be the axon coming down, and here is another situation where right here at the Purkinje cell, you notice where my arrow is. Here's the axon, so the action potential would travel down this direction of the, but it would also travel off on this collateral here, okay? So, let's just go back. Okay, now, the terminus, which is the end of the axon, has many branches. This is referred to as terminus branches. Um, axon terminals, these have been also referred by a variety of names. Being that I've got a lot of neuroscience, it can be get a bit confusing, but basically they also go by the terms synaptic knobs, boutons, terminal buttons, etc. And yeah, some of them put in a little French inflection there. Basic with axon terminals are knob-like distal ending the endings at the end of the terminal branch. So they're kind of like the swellings there. And that's where you're going to have the synapse with whatever cell it is to communicate with. The axon functions are basically as a conducting component to generate and transmit nerve impulses. They also have a secretory component. They release neurotransmitter via ex vesicular exocytosis, and this is a type of information transfer. So it travels throughout most of the cell by either graded potentials or action potentials, but it gets at the end and then it gets converted into a release of a neurotransmitter. Now, axon transport. Most of what we talk about for axon transport is transport of substances, and this can be enzymes, membrane components, from the cell body toward the terminus. And this is basically, you have those neurofilaments, and they've actually seen this with electron microscopy or with very sophisticated video microscopy. And you'll see the objects moving down a little bit, back up, down a little bit, back up, back down a little bit, and they'll continue to progress to the end. But there is also retrograde transport. And this can be the transport of substances from the terminus that is down here to the cell body. And whatever the, these products are, they can be and do include growth factors, bacterial toxins such as tetanus, viruses. These include polio, rabies, and herpes simplex. They will travel from the terminals back up to 
the nucleus. You want to note also that if the axon is cut from the soma, the axon may decay away. Now, a little bit more, and then we're going to summate for the day. Um, but before what we do, let's talk a little bit about the myelin sheath. Think of it this way. You have a white fatty, which is a protein lipoid segmented sheath. And if you've ever seen jelly rolls, how they're kind of like uh, basically flattened out and they start off with some pastry and they have some jelly-like material and then they wrap the whole thing up. Now, this is somewhat similar to how you have the design of the myelination from these uh, Schwann cells. What is the purpose of myelin sheathing? They increase the speed of the terminal, uh, the nerve impulse. You can increase it by the, up to the uh, a factor of about 150 times. So literally what we're talking about is 150 meters per second versus less than one meter a second. They're only found on the axons. Now, let me help you to understand this. In some situations, if you're walking in the middle of the night and you step on a tack or a kid's toy or something, you're going to basically have a real quick reaction on the foot that stepped down on that item. It's going to be pulled back. And at the same time, you're going to have a common reflex that occurs where the foot that stepped down, let's say it's the right foot, it's going to pull back, recoil, but at the same time, you're going to have a stiffening of the left leg. That's so you don't fall down and crash and really wake up everybody and feel foolish. Yes, yes, happened to me. But the key point about this is you have to have a really fast system of signals and coordination. And that happens because of the presence of myelin. All right. Now, the Schwann cells basically wrap and coil their cellular membrane around the axon. They then effectively will squeeze out most of the cell cytoplasm to form layers of membrane. A lipid protein layer acts like an insulator. OK, you're not going to have ions passing in and out. As a matter of fact, on that area of the axon, it will stop making um, the sodium potassium channels once that part of the axon is covered what will happen is you will have a, a jumping of the action potential from the areas where there is no schwann cell is no myelin you can see how this wraps around and around and around notice that uh, at the outermost covering here is still the schwann cell nucleus right there so it's thickest with the cytoplasm on the far edge, but on the, the uh, inner parts, it gets squeezed. And you can see this very clearly on this electron micrograph here. This is a cross section. In here is the axon. In here is the many layers of the myelin sheath. On the edge here is the cell cytoplasm. And to a degree, you have uh, the nucleus somewhere stashed around here. Notice the layers of this. This is providing an exceptional amount of insulation. And as a result, you don't have the need to pass the signal along. Let me go back here for a second. You notice right here, you have the Schwann cell. Notice that you've got a little bit of space right here. And then you have a little bit of space right here and a little bit of space right here between the Schwann cells, so between the myelination. It is at these points where you have no myelination that they're referred to as nodes of Ranvier, otherwise known as neural fibril nodes, okay? These are regularly spaced gaps. They are of my unmyelinated axon. And basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna have the action potential jump from point to point to point to point to point to point. You're gonna reduce the amount of travel time you're going to speed up the signal going from here to here. And that is the purpose of um, myelination. Also, you're going to have nodes that will uh, basically be uh, sites of axon collateral immersion. So in other words, you could sprout out a second collateral of that axon here, and it would subsequently have some of its own myelination there. By the way, just to help you to understand some things, 
we see a lot of myelination very clearly when we talk about structures of the brain. The inner part of the brain, for the most part, you have large, dense areas of myelinated fibers. Okay, that's referred to as white matter. On the edge of, for example, the cortex of the brain, you'll see this grayish matter. This is mostly nerve bodies and unmyelinated fibers. Okay, so you've got gray matter, white matter. This is something to help you to keep in mind. Gray matter, mostly cell bodies, unmyelinated fibers. White matter, that is heavily myelinated fibers. Very important because you're going to have communication from one area of the brain to the other. You want to obviously have the speediest information processing occurring. Okay? At this point, what we're going to do is we're going to conclude and uh, we'll continue this when we meet on Thursday because we're going to get into the rest of the nervous system. Take time to review this. I'm going to leave it up as long as possible, and you should have no problems with this. You can keep coming back to these videos as many times as you would like. Okay? And until then, have yourself a nice day. Stay warm, safe, and dry.